welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Ketavon and today um, I'm going to be doing I guess like a spotlight on a publisher. I've never really done this before. I usually don't really like read publishers um, or select books based on the publisher. But lately I've just been super tempted by Verso. Um, I placed a small order of maybe a month or two ago and I was super happy with it and it was a really, really good deal. I think I got all the books for like maybe five euro each. It was a really, really good deal. And they have another really good deal running right now. I forget the details of it. But essentially, if you buy five books, you get all of those books 50% off. I ordered 10 books, so I got my 50% off, no problem. Um, and those books aren't coming until probably January. But I have my little mini order that I received a couple months ago. And I've already read two of the books in the order, and I really enjoyed them. And since I'm buying more books now, just from Verso, I thought it'd be fun to do a little video um, of all the, uh, the books I'm going to be reading from them. And bonus, since Verso... I think only does, maybe they have a couple fiction titles, but basically it's a nonfiction press. Perfect for nonfiction November. Get your orders in. You won't be able to read it for November. It's a little late, but <laughs> um, this is a really great press. I've loved all the books that I've read from them, and they have a really nice uh, selection. So I'll start off by telling you about the two books that I have read already. So the first one, no, the first one I read was Origin of Capitalism by Ellen Meeksons Wood, I think is how you say her name. Uh, and this was published, I think, in the late 90s, and it was. I guess slowly became a classic. I'm not sure. Like I, I'm not like an economist. I don't really understand what like works or thoughts or fields of, of um, opinions are considered like valid or classic or whatever. But this is essentially considered on some level by some people a classic. And it basically deconstructs how capitalism or originated. And essentially her main argument is that you know, capitalism is not this like natural thing. It is a system that was created because of a series of very specific um, historical contexts and it's not natural, it's not inevitable. Oh, I should add that all these, except for I think maybe one are available on audiobook. So I listened to this one on audio and I really enjoyed it. Um, it was much, I think, easier to digest even though it's short. Um, via audio. And then next up we have uh, Racecraft, The Soul of Inequality in American Life by Karen uh, E. Fields and Barbara J. Fields, who are sisters. Um, one's a historian, I think, and one's a sociologist. So I really, this one's interesting because I really enjoyed it. Like I was like, wow, this is great, fantastic, fantastic. And then the whole last chapter um, they both, I think, studied in France, which is cool. I've studied in France. Like no, no, uh, no complaints on that. But the last chapter just seemed so unnecessary and tacked on, um, basically kind of like analyzing this whole thing through the French view and that kind of like killed it for me. But if you just don't read the last chapter, it's like fantastic. So I don't know how to kind of rate this actually. But yeah, essentially what this is doing, the title is very interesting um, because like, do they even mention it on the back? I don't even think it's in the blurb really. Oh, it is, it is. I just, I'm bad at reading blurbs and remembering them. Um, but essentially it's an examination of the idea of race being the same as the idea of witchcraft. So we know that both of those things aren't real, right? There's no such thing as race, uh, biologically. It's all humans are basically the same and skin color is just sort of like the same thing as eye color or hair color. It doesn't really like mean anything biologically and there are no real differences between races, right? And same with witches. Like we know there are no witches. Like we know that witch trials and witch hunts like aren't fictional, like they're used as an excuse to, you know, perpetuate uh, a system that benefits some people and oppresses others, right? Like we know this, but basically their argument is that race is sort of in the witchcraft era in the sense that multiple people, uh, or I would say maybe the majority of people believe in race and they think race actually means something. And I won't, and I, of course it does mean something. They're not saying like, oh, like we don't see color kind of thing, but more like, the racialization of people is what matters, not the actual race, but so many people just see it as, oh, race means this. Just like, well, if you're this kind of woman, you're a witch, and that means that. Like, And so they really do a really interesting sociological analysis on that, and, and the comparisons between two are really interesting, and I really enjoy it. It's just like, ah, that last chapter. I don't know. Um, but yeah, highly recommend. Minus the last chapter. <laughs> and then the two that I have and I have not read yet, um, one is a little collection of essays um, edited by Angela Davis. It's called If They Come in the Morning, Voices of Resistance. There's, you know, Black Panthers. There's an account of her incarceration. 
uh, an analysis of the prison system in the U.S. Um, so I haven't even flipped through this quite yet, but it's basically, I think, just a collection that Verso put together to have, like, a little sprinkling. Um, this, this collection, uh, it's called the Radical Thinkers Collection. It has these, like, pink stripy covers. They're very much, like, I think, sprinklings of an idea. So I haven't read it yet, um, but it's basically a collection of essays. So we'll see how it goes, and I'm really excited about it. Then the next one is I Rigoberta uh, Menchu, I think is how you say her name, an Indian woman in Guatemala. So I think this was written in the mid 90s or maybe even the early 90s. Uh, and it's written by a Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, Rigoberta Menchu. <laughs> and uh, she essentially wrote this uh, accounting of the genocide that her indigenous people suffered in Guatemala. And uh, this account was used basically to, to maybe not stop the genocide, but kind of like bring justice to it or bring awareness to it. And for that, she won a Nobel Peace Prize. And then of course, later it came out that the details in this memoir, is it a memoir or an account? It's her life story. So it's, it's you know, um, we're not exactly 100% true, but it wasn't like she made up things. It was more like, you know, when they murdered all the people in the village, they shot them in the head. That was the truth. And in her book, she said that they like slashed them to death with machetes to make it like more dramatic and scary and gruesome and to make basically people in the West care, right? So basically, I want to read this because obviously I think her story is important, even if like all the like little details aren't 100% accurate. But also I think it's a really interesting discussion to say like, you know, I mean, when anyone writes a memoir or a biography or an autobiography, they're obviously cherry picking. They're obviously like changing little details, even if they don't really remember that that detail wasn't true. Like memory evolves, memory change. We know this. Nobody really can actually remember anything 100%. Um, so <laughs> oh, I just think it's a really interesting discussion. And I think this will be a really fun, no, interesting book to sort of like explore that idea um, as I read it. So those are the four I have, and now I'm going to go through the 10 that I have on order that I'm going to get probably in January. So the first one is um, called Abortion Beyond the Law by Naomi Brain, and this one is looking at basically like how abortion gets done um, all over the world when the law is not on your side. So like things like accompanying people to appointments, underground abortions, stuff like that from all continents, all kinds of women, lots of grassroots movement, um, you know, exploration and, and discussion on how women just get things done and like they don't need um they're not waiting for laws to change they're just like helping themselves and helping the people around them um so I'm really excited for that one um next is Feminist City by Leslie Kern and the tagline is the feminist city is an ongoing experiment in living differently living better and living more justly in an urban world so basically it looks at urbanism from a feminist perspective and it is super interesting um if you've read Invisible um oh, what's it called it's on my shelf Invisible Women by Christina no Caroline Creado Perez, yeah, um, where, you know, she she looks at a bunch of, like, statistical reasons why women, like, the sexism isn't really, like, oh, we hate women. It's more just, like, we haven't even thought about women. <laughs> and so this is sort of the same thing, except, like, really deep microcosm into urbanism, which I really appreciate because, you know, I mean, I've always lived in cities. Not always, but basically all but, like, two or three years of my life I've lived in a city, and I really... Um, think all the time about how cities are just not functional for most people and the reason you see certain people out in cities is because the city caters to them and so you know I'm really curious to see how she dives into this topic and and uh and goes in deeper and with all the details that I'm so interested in so yeah and then we have Feminism for the 99% um by Chinsia Arusa Titi uh, Bhattacharya and Nancy Fraser. They're three organizers of the International Women's Strike. It's just a manifesto saying that like feminism should be targeting capitalism. Feminism must be anti-capitalist, eco-socialist, and anti-racist. This is a manifesto for the 99%. So I mean, basically like women at the very bottom who really have no agency or power um, in this like system that we've created they need to be prioritized and their needs need to come first beyond, you know, the Sheryl Sandberg lean in type of women. So anyway, that should be really interesting. I'm curious to see um, what they say, maybe like hear more about their activism and what they've done in their work um, more so than getting the general idea. I agree with the general idea already, so they're not convincing me of that. 
Alrighty, and next up we have um, Bodies Under Siege, How the Far Right Attack on Reproductive Rights Went Global by Sean Norris. So if you're familiar at all with the US like impact on abortion, uh, especially in international development funding, you might know already about the Helms Amendment, which is a law in the US um, government that essentially makes it illegal for the US government to pay for abortions in other countries as part of development funding. And, and so what that means is basically, you know, um, if the US is gonna give um, money to an organization, that organization can't use it to pay for an abortion, essentially. Um, you might think that's fair, not fair, whatever. In the 80s, something called the Mexico City policy happened, which basically means that if a Republican per uh, if a Republican president is in office, that uh, gets expanded to any organization that that performs abortions. So um, essentially, if an organization performs abortions, they can never receive any um, U.S. international um, development aid. And so, of course, this means that a lot of international organizations that rely on that aid have stopped performing abortions which of course makes it difficult to access abortions. And then when there's a democratic president, that Mexico City policy is repealed and they are then allowed to be given money even if they perform abortions. But obviously, you know, every four to eight years, an organization can't just like change what they do on the whims of the American president. Um, so basically that means a lot of organizations are not able to provide abortions because they rely on this this fund, this funding. So, you know, you might know about that and say, oh, that's terrible, blah, blah, blah. This book actually looks at how the far right extremists in Europe actually influence American politicians and how they synergetically work together to do this on an international and global scale. So I'm really looking forward to like expanding my conceptualization of this issue because even though I knew that like, you know, American politicians like wheel and deal with right wing people in Europe, um, politicians, I didn't really understand that the inf like the, the influence wasn't I thought the influence was more this way US to Europe and it's actually a bit more Europe to US based on the blurb of this book so anyway um this was a, an investigative journalist who wrote this she um really like apparently dove deep in and like went to meetings and like went undercover at anti-abortion um activist meetings to really figure out what was going on so I'm really really looking forward to this one cannot wait and next up, we have After Work by Helen Hester and Nick uh, Cernick. I'm not sure how to Cernicek. Cernicek? I'm not sure how to say his last name. Um, and this one I'm really curious about because, I mean, we all know that, like, if you work a full-time job, you basically don't actually have time to, like, live. <laughs> and um, let alone, like, raise a family or, like, um, you know, have leisure time or whatever, like, just the life, your life takes up so much time on top of work and, um, you know, between like laundry and cooking and cleaning um, and just like, you know, maintain, barely maintaining social relationships. Like basically we don't have a lot of free time. And in the fifties, when all of this, these technologies were coming out, like the washing machine and the microwave and all these like, oh, this will make your life easier. This will make your life better. Everything will be quicker. We're realizing now that we have less leisure time now than we did then and so it's kind of like what's the disconnect and so this book really explores like how that happened why it's like that um i'm not sure exactly what their conclusions are but the tagline is a history of the home and the fight for free time so obviously they're pro like more free time so i'm just not sure like what their thesis or proposal is to get to that point so i'm curious to read more about that next up we have pharmanomics by nick dearden uh, this one takes a look at how um, pharmaceutical companies are destroying global health like across the board there's lots of examples that like like big examples that you've heard in the news probably like hiv medication the covid vaccine um all of these like big ticket name medications like really the, the global south didn't do not see benefits from this because pharmaceutical companies um really want to extract as much money as possible from richer countries who can afford to pay more so um basically it just kind of has a deep dive in this I'm not sure I'll learn a ton because this is my field a bit so I've heard a lot of this before but I'm really looking forward to you know just doing a deep dive and like really seeing like a, a fully laid out argument um because it's something like anyone in public health like it's like we know we know we don't need to like really like <laughs> do an in-depth analysis to know that big pharma is evil and like is not a real partner with public health, right? Like we know. And so, but I've never really like 
you know, eviscerated them um, by reading a book. So I'll, I'll do that and see how it is. <laughs> um, and then next up we have How Will Capitalism End by Wolfgang Streak. So this one is, I think it's a series of essays and it's really just sort of like, and they're not written um, to be cohesive. They weren't written to be into a book. Um, so this guy, he just is an economist, I believe, and, or maybe a historian, I'm not sure. And he's basically just like imagining, like, like as I mentioned for the earlier book, um, the origin of capitalism, um, like just like feudalism, just like, you know, um, you know, imperial Rome, like all of these systems will eventually end, right? So he's just sort of like imagining how capitalism itself will end. And um, so I'm really curious to sort of explore that because Spoiler, if you're if you're new to this channel, I'm not a fan of capitalism. You might, <laughs> maybe you knew because you clicked on a Verso video, maybe you knew by the description of these books that Verso is a very left-wing publisher. But um, yeah, I don't believe capitalism is a good um, system. And um, I am curious to see how it'll end. Probably not in my lifetime, but you know, thinking about it makes me happy. I don't know. <laughs> Alrighty, so next up we have The Groundings with My Brothers by Walter Rodney. Um, and so this one is funny because I don't think I ever bought or very rarely have I bought like a second book by an author that I haven't read the first book by. So another book by him um, in this press that if you want to read, it's called, I think, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Super classic. It's on my like gonna read very soon shelf in the other room. Um, and basically it just describes how, you know, Europe through neocolonization has extracted wealth from Africa and basically screwed it over. Again, this is not new information, but he's, um, I think, a Guyanese um, activist and scholar who really, like, wrote a really nice book, I think, in the 80s, and that's his book. And then this book, The Groundings with My Brother, a striking book on the international operations of racism and the global meaning of black power. But the blurb says that it's striking in its simultaneous ability to survey the wide and heterogeneous international context while remaining anchored in grassroots politics. He offers firsthand accounts of mass movement organizing, and it, this book has inspired a generation of revolutionaries. So basically, um, I'm just really curious to read all these little examples internationally that still have this cohesive like um, thing because that's, I mean, that's the kind of activism we really need right now. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And uh, then we have Dark Water, um, Voices from Within the Veil. And I think Dark Water is like a short or maybe a long essay by um, W.E.B. Du Bois. And I think this edition has and maybe a couple other works by him, but basically I'm here to read Dark Water. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it's about, but I know that it includes an essay called The Damnation of Women, which is like one of the first works to really like explore how black women are oppressed specifically, um, even though he's a man, like he, he understood and, and knew. <laughs> and so he wrote about it. So I'm really curious to read that essay in particular, uh, which is in his collections. And then last but not least, we have The Invention of the Jewish People by Shlomo Sand. And, um, you know, I've, I'm, I have um, other Palestinian books that I'm reading, and um, there's two other books about Judaism and Israel that I'm reading, or going to be reading. Um, but I picked this one because Shlomo Sand is really an interesting person, uh, at least from what I can tell, because I've never read his books in particular. But based on the blurb, he is a professor in Israel at the University of Tel Aviv, and he currently works there. And most of his books are quite anti-Israel. So I'm really curious to see how his conceptualization um, of the invention of the Jewish people. So basically it says that it's offering a groundbreaking breaking account of Jew Jewish and Israeli history, exploding the myth that there was a forced Jewish exile in the first century at the hands of the Romans. Israeli historian Shlomo Sand argues that most modern Jews descend from converts whose native lands were scattered across the Middle East and Eastern Europe. So it's popular in Israel. Apparently it spent 19 weeks on the Israeli bestseller list. So yeah, I'm really curious to see this because I mean, it's not that I thought that all Jewish people were descended from these people that were, you know, thrown out by the Romans. Um, but I am curious to see like kind of like an Israeli historian kind of deconstructing Israeli myths and, and what he's doing with that. So I'm really, really looking forward to that one. So that is the last of my uh, little haul, pre-haul, I'll say. <laughs> you can go onto Verso Books and check out their collection. They have so, so many books, all nonfiction, all left wing, <laughs> in case you didn't pick up on that. And uh, I really, really love their sales. They're so great. So I, what I do is I get them shipped um, to the UK and then a very nice friend brings them back for me. So I'm really appreciative of him, but I'm, they ship to the 
US, they ship everywhere, I think. It's just the the shipping is, is outrageous to, to Europe. <laughs> the sale will be going through January 1st, so if you want to do your Christmas shopping, if you want to spend your Christmas money, all that's possible. Um, and they have tons of books, lots of options. The sale works is it's 20% off all books, and then if you buy three books, you get 30, four books, you get 40% off, and of course if you buy five or more books, you get 50% off. And if you don't want to worry about customs or shipping or any of that stuff, this also applies to all the formats that they sell, including their ebooks, and their ebooks are actually cheaper than their print books, which I know is not always the case for a lot of publishers, um, and they're very inexpensive, very affordable ebooks. Um, I personally just would don't like buying ebooks, but if you're into that, you can get a really good steal um, on quite a few. So yeah, I hope your interest was piqued a little bit by some of the books in this little mini haul. And um, I hope you find some books um, from the Verso sale for yourself. And if you've read any other books by Verso that you really loved, please let me know down below because I'm, I feel like I'm always like scrolling through their, their catalog um, to see like if there are any that I've missed. So yeah, please let me know your favorites by Verso uh, or any left wing, left wing publisher. I mean, please, like, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, thanks again for watching and until next time. Bye.